Good morning, everybody. Grab your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke 1 is where we'll start this morning. She was a young woman with her whole life in front of her. Uh, She was probably a teenager, as far as we know, living in Israel. Unmarried as of yet, but engaged to be married. She was looking forward to a life, I'm sure, that she was looking forward to a bright future. She was engaged to a man who was poor, but had a good heart, and that's what matters, right, ladies? Hopefully, that's what that was, that's what matters, right? Uh, I'm sure in her head she was making plans, thinking about her wedding, thinking about where she, her family would live, thinking about the children she would have, maybe, maybe plotting out the names for her kids already. I, I'm told girls do that. I'm told guys don't do that. But then everything changed. In one fell swoop, with one meeting, everything changed in her life. So in Luke 1, we'll start in verse, whoop, skipped ahead there. 26, look at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month that her who was called, with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Think about the amount of faith Contained in that one statement. Mary was ready to give up so much to do the will of God. Think about it. She was willing to give up her reputation. When she got the news, Mary, you're going to be pregnant and have a baby. Her reputation was shot. Everyone would have thought she was an adulteress. That she had, well, she's not quite married, but she might as well be that that she had cheated on Joseph, gotten pregnant by another man. She was willing to give up everyone's opinion of her to do what God wanted. She was willing to give up peace in her household. Because can you imagine breaking that news to your mom and dad? How do you think her dad would have responded to that? Her mom, hearing this news. She was willing to give up even her potential marriage because... As far as she knew, as soon as word got out about her state, then Joseph would have said, nope, I'm done with her. In fact, that was his plan. He was going to quietly put her aside until he was informed different by an angel, uh, an angel visitation himself. Reputation, peace, future, everything. It's all on the line. It's all gone. And her response is, hey, I'm the Lord's servant. I don't tell him what to do. He tells me what to do. If God wants it, I want it. I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be to me according to your word. That is a massive and powerful statement made by by someone who would have been uh, young by most of our standards. And yet, when God wanted something, even if it completely shifted the course of her life, she was in. What amazes me about that is she only asked one question. I live with three women. If I'm walking out the door, I get a dozen questions, right? Mary only asked one question. How can this even happen? 
The angel answered it, but she would have been thinking, I'm, I, I would have been asking, when is this going to happen? Why is this going to happen? Why me? A slew of questions. She had one. How? Because her heart said, I serve the Lord. I want what He wants. He's the boss of me. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who aren't impressed with their own opinion, but rather are impressed with the opinion of the Lord. Uh, press, blessed are those who aren't impressed with themselves, but are rather impressed with God. Blessed are those who aren't chasing after their own wants and desires all the time, but rather chase the will of God. Blessed are those who are selfless because they have made room in their lives for God to work. Blessed are those who really, really, honestly, only want what God wants. Blessed are they. Blessed are they who are not self-insistent. Blessed are those uh, who don't want to call the shots all the time. Blessed are the meek. Now my whole life, uh, the, every time a preacher preached blessed are the meek, they started talking about horses, which was always a little confusing. But it goes like this. We'll, we'll run with that analogy uh, the meek are like a horse who has been broken to the bridle. They may have run wild at one time, doing whatever they wanted at one time, but now they obey the rider. And if the rider wants to go somewhere or do something, that, that's what the horse does. So picture that. For us, that would be as if God is our rider, and he's got the reins, and he's calling the shots. So, we're riding along. These are reins. I'm not going to gallop. But these are reins. And God said, hey, I want you to take care of orphans and widows. So, yeah, we go over there and take care of orphans and widows. I want you to sing and make music to me in your heart. Okay, I'm over there. I'm singing and making music to you, to you in my heart. Don't love money. Hit the reins. We stop. Carry my message. Carry my gospel to a world that is lost. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And every time the reins turn, every time there's a hint, every time the the, the reins pull back, or every time there's a yeah, the horse obeys the rider. I was in Peru once. Well, I was there for more than once. I was in Peru for a while. Uh, one day, some of us go out, go out to, there's these little places outside the city. The city of Lima is really ugly. It's a, it's a coastal desert. There's not much green there. So what, what you do is you go outside the city, and there's these little places with actual grass, and they, they have these things called pachamancas, which are like these clay ovens that they cook food. And sometimes there'd be swimming pools. You just go hang out. So I was out there on a Saturday, and there was a guy with horses. And he said, hey, let's ride some horses. Or the guy I was with. So we got on these horses and start riding. And the guy who owned the horses just ran along with us because we're, we're not going fast. Until one of the horses decided to go fast. Uh, one of the girls that was with us, this guy's girlfriend, took off. Bam. And it is sprinting. And we're not riding like over gentle pasture land. We're riding through the streets of town. And that girl had never been on horseback before. And I thought, if she falls off, she's dead. So this is my moment to be a hero. So I'm like, yeah. And my horse gets up going. And I'm chasing her down these, these streets, these Peruvian streets. And as I get closer to her, I hear her yelling at that horse. Because that horse was out of her control. It was doing what it wanted, not what she wanted. And I learned how to badmouth a horse in a whole different language. <laughs> and I, 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 did, I did get to do my hero moment. I rode up beside it and I grabbed the, grabbed the reins and I stopped it, you know. And I, I saved that girl's life. Maybe, maybe not. But at least I, stop, <laughs> I stopped the horse. The horse wasn't doing what the rider wanted. The horse wasn't meek. It wasn't trained. It was... It was following its will, not the will of the rider. Blessed are the meek because they do the will of God eagerly. They're quick to it. They're, they're sensitive to, to what God wants. They're, their ears are perked up listening for His will. Brothers and sisters, that's what you and I have to be. Blessed are the meek. Jesus lived this out. Turn over to Matthew 26. I don't know if this is ever more powerfully illustrated than, than in the life of Jesus right before his arrest. 
starting in verse 36. Jesus, his time of ministry is at an end. The cross is looming. In fact, it's just right there. And Jesus knows what, what's going to happen on that cross. He knows the brutality of that crucifixion. He knows the agony that he's going to face. I suspect that he, he even knows that as he becomes sin, as he accepts the punishment for your sin and my sin, that there's going to be separation from him and God for the first time ever. The upshot of that is he doesn't want to do it. Who wants to be crucified? Verse 36, And Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. God, if there's any other way out of this, let's go with that. If we can save people and cleanse their sin and offer them forgiveness and grace without me having to die like that, let's go that way. But, not as I will, but as you will. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you, do not, that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Three times Jesus went to his father. God, if there's any other way, let's do that. But, not my will, but your will be done. Father, I don't want to bear this agony. I don't want the crucifixion. I don't want the cross. But, what I want doesn't matter. What you want matters. Not my will. Yours be done. Even when it was agonizingly difficult for Jesus, he was still choosing God's will over his will. Folks, we've got to follow his example. Blessed are the meek. And let's flip it. Accursed are those who fight against the reins. If the meek are blessed by following the will of God, then there is a curse upon those who fight against the will of God. Accursed are the stiff-necked. You read the Old Testament, God interacts with the Israelites, and again and again, he describes them as stiff-necked. Meaning, and sometimes he describes their necks as brass, like they're made of metal. Why? Because they won't turn. He's pulling the reins. He's trying to get them to go a certain direction, and they won't listen to him. Woe to those who are stiff-necked. Woe to those who are more impressed with their own opinions. Woe to those who are more interested in satisfying their desires than God's desires. Accursed are the hard-headed, the thick-witted, those who kick against the goads. That's a great biblical term. Accursed are those who keep butting themselves, butting their heads against the will of God, choosing their way instead of His way. Because there are always consequences to that. We could get a lot of testimony in here, couldn't we? If I asked for somebody to testify, could somebody tell me about what they suffered because they wouldn't do God's will and they kept choosing their own will? There are consequences to that. There's fallout to that. Don't be that person. And if you've been fighting it for so long, it's time to let that go. You have no business being in charge of your life. I'll just tell you. You don't. You're not doing a great job of it if you're calling the shots every time. If you think you are, then your standards are way too low. God wants to accomplish powerful, wonderful things through you and in you. But as long as you're fighting his control, those things are never going to happen. The things he wants to bless you with, they're not going to come to fruition because you keep choosing yourself. Don't choose that path. God has more in store for you than you can possibly imagine. He wants to accomplish things through you that, that would blow your mind, I think. Things that you probably think, these, these are impossible right now. 
God can do them if you learn to be meek. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. This one always confused me a little bit. The, with every beatitude, there's always a follow-up to that beatitude, a consequence, a reward uh, of, of the, the, that beatitude being owned in your life and you living it out. This one says they shall inherit the earth. I'm not sure that I want to inherit the earth. I wouldn't mind about 64 acres that I could hunt on. But this, this baffled me for a long time. Here's my take on it. Earlier, it was stated that, that uh, Jesus, no, that was in our Bible class. Evan said this, that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount was quoting things from the Old Testament. I think that's what he's doing here. This is from Psalm 37, 11. It's not stated exactly, so it's at least a reference, if not an outright quote. Psalm 37, 11, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. In that context, see, God had a covenant with the people of Israel based on his relationship with Abraham. And part of that covenant was this idea of a nation and a land. That one day Abraham's descendants, when he got them to the promised land, they would have a certain bit of land. And God even mapped it out. He's like, it's from here to here and here to here. And part of his covenant with them was called the covenant of blessings and curses. Deuteronomy 28. So their ability to possess all the land, meaning all the blessing God was going to give them, was dependent on them keeping covenant, on them being meek, on them doing his will instead of their will. But it didn't always work out like that. Because a lot of times they'd choose their way over his way. And every time they chose their way over his way, their enemies would encroach and some of their towns and territory would be invaded, and they wouldn't have control of it. But then they'd turn back to God, and they'd, they'd be meek again and, and keep his covenant, and then they would get all the land back. And it was just this ebb and flow of having the blessings of God and giving up the blessings of God based on whether they would be obedient to God or not. Does that kind of work the same way with us? I think it does. I know that we live in under, under a different covenant, but meekness, basically I think Jesus is saying here, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit all the blessings and promises that God has in store for them. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the obedient, blessed are those whose ears are attentive to the Lord's desire, blessed are those who are quick and eager to do God's will. For they shall receive the fullness of the blessings of God and reap the harvest of all his good promises. So, if our meekness, if our obedience to God, if our attentiveness to his will and, and willingness to follow him and obey him, if, if those promises are contingent on that, what are some of those promises? I'm going to run through a list. This is from Isaiah 41. Man, guys, Isaiah is a rich, rich book. Give it a read if you haven't in a while. God says, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Do you want those promises in your life? That God is with you? That God, he's, he's with you to strengthen you and help you. And he will uphold you. And sometimes life gets scary and chaotic and things seem out of control. But God's saying, if you're with me, I'm with you. And I'm going to hold you up no matter what goes on. No matter what chaos or despair or storm is raging in your life. I'm with you. I'm going to hold you up. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. What Isaiah is saying here is, look, the person whose mind is focused on God and who has constructed their lives around following him and living for him, he will, that person will be kept in perfect peace. If you're losing your peace, more than likely that means you've taken your eyes off of God. You started thinking about something else or building your life around something other than him and you, you put yourself on unsteady ground 
Return. Place your stuff on the rock that is God. Put your mind on Him. He'll keep you in perfect peace. John 16, Jesus tells them, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Two things there. That peace that you find in Jesus that is beyond understanding and the knowledge that He's overcome the world, no matter what the world throws at you, you've got Jesus. He's beat the world. He's overcome it. He's in charge. Trust in that peace. Psalm 37 again. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall. For the Lord holds them by the hand. You ever been walking with your kids? And they're holding your hand? And they stumble, and you, but you've got their hand, so they're not going to fall. There, there are tons of videos on YouTube, if you want to check it, of little kids doing dumb stuff and about to hurt themselves, but their dad's right there and swoops in and catches them. You guys ever seen any of those? That's what he's saying here. God's watching your steps. If you're a godly person, if you're following him, he's right there with you. And you may stumble every once in a while, but you're not going to fall and hurt yourself because God is taking care of you. Matthew 11, come to me, Jesus says, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Do you feel like you have rest? The world we live in can make you feel disturbed and worn out and exhausted and fatigued. Jesus wants to give you rest. If you're feeling worn out all the time, maybe that tells you that you're not with Jesus, that you've stepped away from Him, from His strength and protection Come to Him. He wants to give you rest. Romans 8, 28, We know that all things, in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Everything. You love God. You've been called according to His purpose. Everything going on in your life, God starts working it out for your good. That doesn't mean nothing bad will ever happen, but it means the second something bad does happen, God is taking it and working it and reworking it for your good. Guys, those are powerful promises. That's just a fraction of the promises you inherit if you're meek. So let me close by saying this. If you're fighting it, stop fighting it. Give it up. You're only hurting yourself. You're not doing yourself any good by resisting God. It's time for you to let go of the lordship of your life and put it in the hands of the one who loves you best, the one who made you, the one who knows you. Let God have the reins. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. If anybody has any need, please come forward while we stand and sing.